if you if you realize how important that 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 teaching that I gave you, you know, that the first teaching, um, John chapter 15 verse 9, Jesus is saying to you and me this morning, again, he says, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you, abide in my love. And later on in that, just a few verses, I think around about verse 15, 16, he says, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, that you may bear fruit, he says, and your fruit may remain. So how do I bear fruit? Unless I abide in the vine, unless I stay connected to Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the life of God cannot flow into me and cannot bear the fruit. You saw yes, last evening's teaching. The Holy Spirit comes because the works of the flesh are all that evil. But the fruit, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, gentleness, kindness, patience, faithfulness, self-control. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. And each of, I, and, and all that is contained in that one fruit that is love. You know? If you take again 1 Corinthians chapter 13, if you go to take what St. Paul says about love, you'll see all those other kindness, gentleness, patience, everything in that, what he says, love us. And so, and so God, so, so love, see, you and I are created to, to breathe the air of love. When, when God created our first parents, he breathed into him. Whoa, he said. And that's the breath of God. The breath of God is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the love between the Father and the Son. So man is created to live by the love of God. And without that love, I die. Everything crumbles. Life is so difficult. So we have to connect daily, daily, daily to the love of God. So that's why I keep rehearsing this truth, hoping that you won't forget this. Every day you'll come. In your time of prayer, I do this every day, every day. And so just once again, let's do this. Look up to God. Wait on. And, and before we can connect, remember verse 9 is, as the fathers love me, so have I loved thee, abide in my love. But then to connect to the love of God, Jesus places one condition. And what is that condition? Love, come on, say it. Love one another as I have loved you. So as a Christian, I have to be in right relationship with everyone. Everyone. Irrespective of what they've done and said, I have to forgive. If I don't forgive, I don't connect. If I don't connect, I'm dying. See, it's simple it is, but serious. Then we will pray, we will run for meetings, reading our Bibles, but we are miserable inside, anxious, sad, lonely, depressed, you know, um, fearful, insecure. All these negative emotions are tearing my life apart and then I'm going to church, I'm praying and doing all these things. It won't work. It will just cannot work. You have to get back to the reality of the faith. You have to live the faith. And so let the Holy Spirit search your, search your hearts and see. Is there, is there anyone you have, as Jesus says in Mark 11, 25, whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone. So that's why Jesus says, when you bring your gift to the altar, leave your gift, he says, leave it. Go and be reconciled, he says. Don't offer your prayers. Don't offer your, 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 your offering. I will not... Look at it, I will not accept it. First, go and be reconciled, he says. And we are living with so many strained, broken relationships. And, and then we just come to pray. At least if I am coming to pray for grace, to forgive, then Jesus understands. Because forgiveness is divine. It's, it's impossible for us. It's divine. We need grace. So Jesus says, stay connected. My love will enable you. That's why we need the love of God. My love will enable me to imitate Him. Because He loves you, He loves me unconditionally. Nobody loves you unconditionally. That's why Jesus must be my first love. No husband loves his wife unconditionally. That's why he grumbles, grumbles, grumbles. And neither any wife loves her husband unconditionally. She's grumbling. Parents, children, everywhere. Conditional love, conditional love. And we are all suffering, suffering, suffering. So the 
antidote to this suffering is to love like God loves. We are the children of God. God is my father. God is love. And so from the day we meet Jesus, he's only teaching us to love, 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 love. Okay? So come on, think now. And just make a decision to forgive those that you know that you're not in a right relation, those that have hurt you, made life difficult for you. Make a decision, say, I forgive you, I forgive you, I forgive you. Then later on, when you go back home, you can see how practically you work at home. Start praying for those, for, the, for those that have hurt you. And work on the strain and broken relationship. Now say this after me. Abba Father, Abba, Father. you are my father. Yes. And I am your child. Yes. And every facet of my life, yes. even a hair on my head, is taken into account by your loving, caring, healing, freeing, providing, and sanctifying love. I have nothing to be anxious about. Every detail of my life is taken into account. And no power on earth can come against your holy will, your plan. In my life, I abandon my life to you. And I trust in your love and care. And find my rest and peace in you alone. Oh, come, deep down, take on the attitude of a little child. One more thing, sisters and brothers. In, when I gave you that teaching on sin and how to come out of sin, as I said, we have such a deadly frightening, horrifying disease within you and me. And that is, come on, that is sin. That is, and listen, it's so deadly that it has taken the life of God to save me from it. Such a deadly sin. Such a deadly disease. It's taken nothing less and the life of Jesus to free me from its deception, from, from its control, from its slavery, from its captivity, from its horrifying effects. And so if I take my walk with God seriously, immediately I'll come to realize where there is sin in my life, what is keeping me from God. And so I have to tirelessly come to Jesus day after day, day after day, day after day. And that's why I even explained to you that that's what the Eucharist is all about. Jesus comes to you and me in the Eucharist to heal me and to free me from sin. So every day you must come to Jesus to come out of sin. And this will happen to you. You will, you will come face to face with this tragedy in our lives and, and turn to Jesus provided, I believe this, provided on one condition that my life is surrendered. If my life is not surrendered to Jesus, then I will, I will not come face to face with this horror of sin and the Spirit cannot inspire me to go to Jesus to come out of sin. And I'm stuck in my walk with God. So it's very important about our true identity. Our true identity, identity is that we are the beloved sons and daughters of God. That's our true identity. So let me start with, a, with an experience of mine. You know, God touched my life in, in, in 1972. And by His grace, He gave me a tremendous burden to preach and to, and to take the gospel and, and tell my Catholic brothers and sisters, wake up, wake up, come to know Jesus, come to know the Father, come to know the Holy Spirit. And that burden was so great, I couldn't sleep at night. I'd be praying and praying and praying for my immediate family and for the church at large, for the salvation of souls. And then in 1976, four years later, God opened the door for me and I launched out into my full-time Christian work. You know, and God has given me the, it's a gift, it's a grace. God has given me the gift of preaching. So right from the start, from the time I started this work, I would always get a lot of positive, what do I say, flack positive strokes. Oh brother, you're so good and this and this and, and, and my diary would be full and, and invitations would come from here, invitations were coming from here 
and I began start I started my work in India then I began visiting neighboring countries and and I thought everything is fine you know then the Lord took me and my family to Malta that's a small little island in in Europe as a missionary family I joined the Institute for World Evangelization ICP mission we're a lay Catholic commu community with uh, or, uh, organization with pontifical rights. Rome has recognized us. And so I, I, uh, I joined this organization in 1989 after I did a school of mission. I was in Malta. And on our three early holiday, I came to Bangalore and my, I came back home here for a holiday with my wife and children. And my sister said to me, you know something, there's a great preacher. Wow, he's so amazing. He comes to Bangalore, 600 will come for a retreat, signs and wonders, people are healed and marvelous and he's, he's very powerful. And that <laughs> preacher happens to be my classmate. He and I were in school together. So outwardly, I said, praise the Lord. Wow, wonderful. But inwardly, wow, I felt threatened immediately. I said, oh Lord, I'm no more than number one. Lord, I've lost my place. No more I'll be in demand. This is all going inwardly. I felt jealous. I felt deeply insecure. I felt threatened. And of course, I can't camouflage it with saying to my family, praise the Lord, wonderful, wonderful. But inside, jealousy, insecurity, fear, a sense of loss came to me. No, I didn't know how to handle this. So I said to myself in my mind, okay, I'm here in Bangalore for, for, for a month's holiday. I'm going back to Europe. Who cares? Let him come here. Let him preach. It doesn't affect me. I'm in another part of the world. Now that's the escape route I took. But that's not the answer. I didn't know better. So I said, let him come. Let him preach. Let him be great. But it doesn't affect me. I'm in another continent. You follow what I'm saying? But that's why I say to you, if you don't surrender your will to God, you will get stuck. God is Father. God knows now the, the, the terrible mistake that I'm making, that I'm finding my identity in what I do, and I'm not rooted in my true identity as a son, a beloved of the Father. I don't know this. So I go back to Malta, and God in His graciousness there's a beautiful woman of God who has a powerful, you know, ministry of inner healing. And she's in Switzerland. And, and one of, you know, one of my friends in Malta says, Fritz, I want you to go for her week's teaching. And she pays for my flight, does everything. I go to Switzerland to, to sit under the teaching of this woman of God. And then, as I sit and listen to her, I said, wow, I found my answer. I realize the tragic mistake I'm making, finding my identity in what I do and who I am. And from that then, and she teaches beautifully and she says, because of sin, we're all bent towards the creature, towards creation. I'll explain that more clearly to you. So we have to straighten up. And I realized I was bent towards my ministry to tell me who I am. So when I, when I found out that there was someone more powerful or more you know, anointed by God, I felt terribly insecure, jealous, fearful, that I even said, oh my God, will I be in demand? Will people call me to preach here? So from that day onwards, that's why you see, when God gives you these keys, if, if we are in the spirit, we allow God to be God, God will speak strongly and says, Fritz, here is a medication. Take this medication for this frightening disease in your life. And by the grace of God, by the Holy Spirit, you will take this medication day after day, day after day, day after day. So every day from that, that day onwards when I heard this, I would bend to the right and I, I'm very simple. I would bend to the right and say, Lord, I confess my false source of identity, that I'm finding my identity in, in, in what I do in my preaching ministry. I confess it as sin. I say no to it. Please forgive me. And then I would straighten up and I'll pray to the Father and say, Abba, Father, you are my Father, I'm your Son. This is my true identity. I am your Son, Father. 
and and as and as I reflected on it, you see, a little child is totally free to be himself. No, he's not aware of what people think and people, he doesn't bother. All that matters is, I'm in, pres in the presence of daddy, daddy loves me just as I am, and I can be free, like Jesus. I'll, I'll, I'll show you. So, so I looked up and I said, and I long to be, that I forget everything, everyone, and I say, I receive the freedom to live the life of a son of God. I receive it, Father, because that's who I truly am. And Father, I long to be like your son Jesus, who was totally free to be himself. And then in deep silence, I, I, I contemplate this divine reality, this divine truth, that God is my father and I am his son. Every day for the next, even now. now God knew maybe two or three years later, he was bringing me back to India. God told me, leave Malta and come back to India. So when I come back to India, I come back to my city and I'm, I'm just saying this, I'm, just because of the truth, not to find fault with anyone, please don't mis mis misunderstand me, okay? So when I come back to Bangalore, you know, like, I'm one of the pioneers of the charismatic renewal in India, in 1972. Father Fio, Father Rufus, Father James, all of us came, had our charismatic experience in 1972. So in Bangalore, I started the renewal and started all the prayer groups. So I would imagine that when I come back to Bangalore, they would be excited and, and the prayer group that, that I started is still continuing. I think it's the largest prayer group in Bangalore at the moment, very vibrant prayer group. So all these men who, in a sense, have discipled and raised up, they would be happy, you know, that their guru has come back. And they give him a good welcome. I come back to Bangalore. No, when I go to the prayer meeting, no welcome. No one bothers. They didn't even call me to give a talk. Now, if I had not rehearsed my identity, I'm trying to bring out a point, not to find fault with the people. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm trying to bring home a truth. If I had not been rehearsing my identity, can you imagine? And if that poison continued to be in my soul, I didn't know how to be healed of that. When I come back to Bangalore, what do you think my reaction would have been? I would have been hurt, yes or no? I would have been so hurt, so angry. I would have judged those, those young men that I'd raised up and said, oh, it was nice, I did all this for you, now you ignore me. And I would have been bitter, angry. I'm supposed to be a servant of God and look at the, all the sinful emotions. But that didn't happen at all. It didn't affect me, it affected me little, but immediately I realized, I said, wow, there again I go, I'm trying to find my identity in what I'm doing, and that is sin. So I immediately, I would shun it and say, no God. You know, my life doesn't depend whether people accept me, people call me or don't call me. My relationship is with you. You are my father, I'm your son, you open doors for me, you close doors for me, my life is dependent on you. And I was able to come out of it. And I'm out of it. You know? So now it doesn't matter. Now, for example, I've gone to New Zealand now. There the ministry is so shallow. That's a spiritually dead country. No ministry. Now I can say to myself, man, what am I doing in this country? I've given my life to preach and what am I doing? But no, I'm looking at this time that God has taken me there you know, to deepen my relationship with Jesus, to allow him to redeem me from sin, to enjoy his presence, to grow in deeper intimacy with, with, with him, because that is my prime vocation. And it is God who opens doors, God who closes the doors. When God opens the door for me to go on ministry, I will go. And I'm happy where I am. And God is beginning to open doors, I'm pushing doors also going to the prisons and starting groups here and making myself, and God is beginning to open doors for ministry. Do, do you understand what I'm trying to convey? Okay, so our identity, your true identity, is that you're a son and daughter of God. And this identity, I must allow it to, you know, permeate my whole life. My whole life. Now, now let me come into this, in, into this teaching. You see now, the life of Jesus, okay? At the age of 12, 
when, when Mary and Joseph lost him in, in Jerusalem, finally they find him in the temple. And so you see, Jesus at that young age, 12 years old, he's already, he knows who he is. And when Mary says, son, why have you done this? We are so anxious. Three days we are searching for you. He looks at his mother and father and says, Ma, don't you know I have to be about my father's business, he says. Already at a young age, he knows who he is. He is a son of the father. And he's finding his vocation in what the father's asking him to do. And then, of course, as a young boy, he goes back with Mary and Joseph, and he lives in obedience, and he grows in favor with men and with now at the start of his public ministry, Jesus, God the Father, realized his son in his humanity had to be further rooted in his true identity. And so at his baptism, when the Holy Spirit comes upon him, the, Jesus hears the audible voice of his father saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So Jesus starts his public ministry rooted in his true identity as the beloved son of the father. Now the spirit leads him immediately into the wilderness to fast and pray. Now the devil comes to tempt him. And the devil in a sense is attacking his true identity and saying, if you are the son of God, turn these stones into bread. Come on, prove yourself. Your true identity you discover your true identity, the devil, in what you do. Come on, prove yourself. Do this. Turn this, these stones into bread. And Jesus says, um, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that pro proceeds from the mouth of God. Now, because of our fallen nature, listen carefully, because of our fallen nature, I can't help finding my identity or finding my rest, finding my peace. You see, there's a question in all of us, who am I? Who am I? What am I here for? This is a question in all of us. And we try to find the answer in my sinful nature, in my fallen nature, in three things. The first thing is in what I do. That's why Satan tempts Jesus and says, if you are the son of God, do this. And, Je and Jesus overcomes that temptation. Jesus says to himself, I know who I am. I am the beloved son of the father. I don't have to prove myself. I don't have to do something to discover who I am. I already know who I am. The next temptation, and, and, and we also try to, because of our fallen nature, we try to find our identity in the next thing, and that is, uh, in, in what people say about me. Right? So the devil takes Jesus and talks to the, on the steeple in Jerusalem, in the temple, and he says, fall down. And don't you know the scriptures will fall, you know, like a feather, the angels will bear you, nothing will happen. The whole of Jerusalem will see you and they will acclaim you as the Messiah. They will praise you, they will, they will marvel at you and, and, and you will receive praise and, and glory from the people. And Jesus says, no, he says, it is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. You know something, we are so prone to this, what people say about us, which is tears our lives apart. That's why when people gossip, people slander, people talk again, we get so disturbed. Terribly disturbed. We get hurt. We get angry. We want to fight back. We want to vindicate, prove ourselves. This is all sin. But if I'm rooted in my identity, I'm a son of God, loved by the Father, just as I am, let you say what you want. You know? So what people say about them, but we are so prone, we are so, what do I say, sensitive to what people think and people say about us, you know. And that ruins our walk with God. Then you know what happens? We become more men pleasers than God pleasers. You'll find in, in, in John chapter 12, in John chapter 12, I think roundabout was 40, John chapter 12 was 40, it's John records that many of the authorities believed in Jesus but were afraid to acknowledge him publicly because they would be pushed out of the synagogue because they loved the praises of men more than the praises of God. Now, can you see the wisdom of Mother Church? As I said, the, the, the father, just before he receives communion, 
receives communion, he says this prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, by the will of the Father and the work of the Holy Spirit, uh, your death brought life to the world. May this, uh, by, may this body and blood which I receive free me from sin and every evil and keep me faithful to your teaching. Do you know, it, it takes supernatural grace to be faithful to the, to, to the teaching of the church and to be faithful to scripture because you, we will be opposed. We will be opposed. It's not easy. The first sermon Jesus preached, what did they want to do to him? Stone him and kill him. The first sermon. Jesus' ministry would have ended then only. He said, these guys are out to get me. And fear would have entered his heart and he could not have continued. But he was rooted in his identity, so rooted in his father's love, in divine providence. He says, my father, you are my father, I'm your son. Nothing can come my way without your permission. And if it's your will for me to be stoned, so be it. And they couldn't touch him. And so St. John will continue writing about Jesus. There were so many attempts on his life because of what he did and what he, what he said. His hour had not come. His hour had not come. His hour had not come. And finally, at the Last Supper, John will say, now the hour has come.